Throughout history, countless human societies have executed criminals for their crimes. In the medieval times, the death penalty was common for crimes that we view today as relatively innocent, such as arson or poaching animals. Some ancient societies were surprisingly similar to our own, reserving the death penalty for only the most serious crimes such as murder or treason. Some might argue that it doesn't really matter how someone on death row is killed. Is there really any difference between firing squads, gas chambers, or lethal injection? Don't all of these methods ultimately lead to the same end result? When you consider some of the more unique methods of execution in historical times, it becomes clear that there is a considerable difference between humane executions and capital punishments that border on the sadistic. For example, the ancient Romans had a variety of insane and excessively brutal execution methods, such as crucifixion, being buried alive, or simply being thrown off the Tarpeian Rock. Many of these executions were seen as a form of entertainment, taking place before cheering masses at the Colosseum. Some criminals were even sewn into sacks with monkeys, dogs, snakes, and roosters before being thrown into a river. Today, we like to pride ourselves in our clinical, detached, and professional execution methods. But are these methods really that humane? Judging by the execution of Joseph Wood, the answer to that question would be a resounding no. Joseph Wood was convicted of shooting and killing his girlfriend and her father 25 years ago. He was sentenced to die for the crimes, but Wood's execution by lethal injection didn't go as planned. This individual suffered for almost two hours as he was given a total of 15 lethal injections. It is one of the worst examples of a botched execution in history, and it caused considerable controversy across the United States. But why did Joseph Wood take so long to die? Why didn't the lethal injection kill him quickly? Did he really deserve this type of punishment in the first place? Let's find out. Joseph Rudolph Wood III was born on December 6th of 1958 in Belton, Texas and eventually started living in Pima County, Arizona. Not much is known about his early life, although at some point in the beginning he began a relationship with a woman named Debbie Dietz. This on and off relationship lasted for five years, during which there were many breakups. There were also numerous reports of domestic violence, which led Dites to obtain a protective order against Joseph. Debbie often wore sunglasses to hide black eyes and facial lacerations, the result of beatings carried out by Wood. According to court documents, Debbie was actually supporting Wood financially while they were living together in an apartment. Eventually, she decided to end the relationship once and for all and moved back in with her parents. Debbie's father prevented Joseph from visiting her while she was working at the family body shop during this period. This enraged Joseph, and he vowed to get revenge. On August 7th of 1989, Wood walked into the body shop owned by the Dites family. Initially, Debbie's brother tried to stop him from entering but Joseph pushed him aside and eventually located Debbie's father, Gene. He waited patiently for Gene to finish his phone call before shooting him in the chest with a 38 revolver. He then turned to Debbie, held her in place, and shot her twice. 
both victims died of their gunshot wounds. Joseph then tried to flee, but he was quickly apprehended by police officers. Initially, he obeyed their directions and put down his weapon, but without warning, he suddenly scrambled for the revolver on the floor and pointed it at officers. This was likely an attempt to bring about his own death, in other words, to commit suicide by cop. Joseph was struck several times by multiple projectiles as police opened fire, but somehow the murderer managed to survive his wounds after extensive surgeries and faced legal consequences for his actions. Joseph Wood faced many charges, including two counts of murder in the first degree and two counts of aggravated assault. Since he had pointed a gun at two officers, there were several aggravating circumstances including grave risk of death to others. Although he received a prison term of 30 years for the two counts of aggravated assault, he was sentenced to death for the two murders. However, he would spend decades in prison before he was actually executed. In 2014, he filed an action seeking information about the specific method of his execution, which was scheduled later that year. Joseph's attorneys were incredibly concerned about the exact types and combinations of drugs that could be used. Court documents showed that this filing led to a considerable discussion about the two-drug protocol, the exact drug manufacturer information, and other details. His attorneys argued, Exposing the names of the manufacturers of drugs used in lethal injections is especially important in light of the seismic shift in the lethal injection world in the last five years, and the flawed executions this year involving the drugs at issue here. The flawed executions referred to by Wood's lawyers involved two other criminals who were given the death penalty that year. Dennis McGuire and Clayton Lockett. McGuire's execution lasted for over 25 minutes, during which he writhed and struggled in pain while making choking noises. The execution should have lasted only 8 minutes. This ultimately led to a moratorium on executions in Ohio for 3 years. Lockett took 43 minutes to die, speaking throughout the process writhing in pain and at one point even attempting to get up from the execution table. He was supposed to be unconscious during the entire process. Judging by these incidents, it's not surprising that Wood was filing requests to the court in an attempt to learn more about the drugs they were going to use to kill him. Little did anyone know that Joseph's execution would last far longer than either of these earlier incidents. On July 23rd of 2014, Joseph Wood's execution proceeded as scheduled. He decided not to have a special last meal, instead eating his normal dinner along with the other inmates. Court documents state that he also ate two cookies prior to his execution. Wood was to be given a combination of two drugs, midazolam and a painkiller called hydromorphone the exact same drugs used in the boxed execution of Dennis McGuire earlier that year. This was the only time this combination of drugs had been used prior to Wood's execution, and at 1.52 p.m. the execution began. Arizona reporter Michael Kiefer witnessed the execution in its entirety. He stated that Wood's eyes were flitting back and forth as an IV line was put into his arm. The drugs were injected, and by 1.57 he was unconscious. However, Wood unexpectedly woke up seven minutes later, turning his head around and making eye contact with the family of the murder victims. According to Kiefer, he then seemed to laugh at them before speaking his last words. He said that he had found Jesus and that he hoped the Lord would forgive them all. A chaplain sat nearby, 
counting beads on a rosary and praying silently. Eventually, the priest stopped praying and simply watched as Joseph seemed to settle down. It seemed to everyone that Joseph was about to die, no more than eight minutes after the drugs had entered his bloodstream. But Wood did not die. Instead, he started to open his mouth as if struggling to breathe. Kiefer reported that he gulped like a fish on land, making sounds similar to when a swimming pool filter starts taking in air. The reporter later stated that it was death by apnea and that he started counting Joseph's gasps. Scribbling on a notepad, Kiefer counted a total of 640 gasps over the next hour and a half. He then turned to another reporter and whispered, I don't think he's going to die. The other reporter whispered back in agreement. Behind the scenes, prison staff were desperately putting more drugs into Joseph's bloodstream, eventually giving him a total of 15 separate doses of midazolam. Protocol states that only one dose may be administered, but vague guidelines allow for an additional dose if deemed appropriate. The execution lasted for so long that Wood's attorneys were able to leave the room call a federal judge and conduct a 30-minute telephone hearing in which they begged to have their client resuscitated. Finally, at 3.48 p.m., Joseph gasped for the last time and was pronounced dead one minute later. The execution had lasted for almost two hours. So why did Joseph take so long to die? It was probably a combination of factors, but the short answer is that the state of Arizona botched the execution. The long answer is much more complicated. States that allow the death penalty have been struggling to obtain the necessary drugs for many years. Shortages have forced them to try new options, and this often leads to questionable results. Many American and European manufacturers that produce the most suitable drugs for executions refuse to provide these drugs to prisons due to ethical concerns. These issues ultimately led Arizona to try midazolam, a highly unreliable drug that has a long history of causing drawn-out executions. Florida was one of the first states to use this drug, and it immediately became clear that midazolam caused executions to last much longer than the recommended duration of 8 to 10 minutes. Florida eventually recommended midazolam doses of 500 mg for executions, but Joseph Wood was only given 50 mg as his first dose. The family of Debbie and Eugene Deitz were furious that the media focused on Wood's death rather than the victims. Upon hearing that reporters were describing his execution as excruciating, Debbie's sister replied, You don't know what excruciating is. Excruciating is seeing your dad lying there in a pool of blood. Seeing your sister lying there in a pool of blood. That is excruciating. This man deserved it. The state was much more sympathetic. Governor Jan Brewer ordered a full review of Arizona's execution system. A day after Wood's death, Arizona temporarily halted all executions so that it could review and improve its procedures. Joseph's lawyer argued that the execution represented a constitutional violation as it was an example of cruel and unusual punishments. Despite numerous contradicting accounts, the director of Arizona's Department of Corrections and the Arizona Attorney General's office insisted that Joseph died peacefully. Did Joseph Wood die in a humane manner? No, in fact, one might argue that it would have been more humane to simply allow Joseph to die from his gunshot wounds on the day of the murders, 
Although, doctors would have been forced to treat him with the best of their abilities due to the ethical standards and the Hippocratic Oath. But what about the firing squad? Or a hanging? Wouldn't this be faster and easier than a two hour long painful ordeal? Why does the United States favor lethal injection over other execution methods? Ironically, states started using the lethal injection method in the 1980s because it was deemed more humane. Of course, many people would argue that the death penalty itself is inhumane. These people are currently in the minority, however, as the most recent polls suggest that about 60% of Americans still favor the death penalty for those convicted of murder. The temporary pause on execution after Wood's death has lasted for eight years in Arizona. However, this pause has now come to an end, as in April of 2022, it was announced that Clarence Dixon, a convicted murderer, will be the first person to face lethal injection in Arizona since the botched execution of 2014. Perhaps Clarence will die quickly. Perhaps not.